Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It is my privilege to be able to welcome all of you to this webinar, A World Free from Nuclear Weapons. The event today is sponsored by the Vatican Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development in partnership with the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs, Georgetown University, as well as Georgetown University Press, the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, Keough School of Global Affairs, University of Notre Dame, and the Catholic Peace Building Network, and of course, all of the organizations and people that all of you bring with, with you today. 2,800 years ago, Isaiah, son of Amos, dreamed of a day when nations would be disarmed. He saw the day when the peoples would beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, when nations would not lift a sword against another or learn war anymore. Gathered here today, we are the present day bearers of that dream. And while it may be true that the weapons of war have incrementally increased in intensity with the number of years that it's been since Isaiah had that dream, it is just as true that the dream itself is equally growing in intensity. In September 2017, the Vatican was the first state to sign the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. In November, the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development followed up with a conference on disarmament in the Vatican called A World Free from Nuclear Weapons. Pope Francis, 11 Nobel Peace Prize laureates and other persons representing diplomacy, international organizations, ordinary people in society and religion contributed to the discussion. For the first time in history, a sitting pontiff clearly stated in his address to the conference participants that the very possession of nuclear weapons is to be firmly condemned. Two years later in Hiroshima, whose people endured a nuclear attack in 1945, he reiterated this, the use of atomic energy for purposes of war is immoral, just as the possession of nuclear weapons is immoral. Lastly, in Fratelli Tutti, issued at the beginning of October this year, Pope Francis states that the ultimate goal of the total elimination of nuclear weapons becomes both a challenge and a moral and humanitarian imperative. Therefore, with Pope Francis in the lead, Catholics and all people of goodwill around the world are called to embrace the ethics pronounced by Jesus that we put away our swords so as not to be destroyed by them and to become peacemakers, children of God through fraternity and social friendship. On the eve of the date in early 2021, when the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons goes into effect, the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development wants to jumpstart the discussion begun three years ago in November, so that one day others may not have to have this discussion. Joining us today are speakers, His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Turkson, Prefect, of the Vatican Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. We have His Excellency Monsignor Paul Richard Gallagher, Secretary for Relations with States of the Holy See's Secretary of State. We have Alexei Arbatov, Head of the Center for International Security at the Primakov National Research Institute of World Economy and International Relations. We also have Father Drew we also have uh, Father Drew Christensen, a distinguished professor of ethics and human development in Georgetown's School of Foreign Service and a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. Kelsley Davenport also with us, director for nonproliferation policy at the Arms Control Association. 
Jeremy Faust, former intern of the Holy See Mission in New York. Beatrice Finn, executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Marek Misak from Comisse, policy advisor for external relations for the Commission of the European Bishops. Ksenia Pirinaskaya, education director of the CTBTO Youth Group. Thank you so much for all of you for joining us and for offering your voices and your expertise to this discussion. Each of you will have five minutes to respond. Uh, we'll have some questions for you. And afterward, we do hope to open the floor to questions that may come to us through the chat. We begin now with the Prefect of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Turkson. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for giving me the word. So uh, the Archbishop uh, Gallagher and all of you, Reverend Fathers, and all of you distinguished speakers, it's certainly a pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon, uh, morning, wherever you are, or evening, to this virtual book launch as an occasion to share the fruits of your common and various reflections on humanity's possession and use of nuclear weapons, as well as an occasion for the dicastery to celebrate an instance of its compliance with the recommendation of the Fathers of the Second Vatican Council to provide an eloquent proof of uh, the Church's solidarity with, as well as its respect and love for the entire human family by engaging with it in conversation about its various problems. The problem of the human family here is the use of nuclear energy as a weapon and its proof of solidarity and love for the human family was at the Cassius holding of a high level seminar between the winter of 2016 and the spring of 2017 on how to move the world away from developing and stockpiling such weapons under the topic disarmament. And this, the Dicastery enjoyed a collaboration of the University of uh, Georgetown, represented by Father Drew Christensen, the Institute of World Economy and International Religions, represented by Dr. Alexei uh, Arbatov, Stanford University, represented by Ambassador Rose Grote Müller, and the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, represented by the Nobel Prize laureate Beatrice Finn. The book we launched virtually, A World Free from Nuclear Weapons, is a collection of the proceedings of that seminar, which Reverend Christensen graciously accepted to be its chief editor, and the Dicastery owes him a debt of gratitude for it. So this is the booklet. Uh, suppose uh, you probably either holding copies or will soon be holding uh, copies. So the Dicastery always recalls how with this uh, call to political friendship in his encyclical letter, Pacham in Paris, Pope John, Pope John XXIII helped move the world back from the precipice of nuclear conflagration on which it tottered during the Cuban Missile Crisis. In the period of detente that followed, it was hoped that a nuclear weapons state would engage and build trust that would discourage investment in nuclear arsenals. That regrettably has not happened. Rather, we witness in that the legal framework for non-proliferation and disarmament within governments and regimes is weakening. In fact, some would say disintegrating. That new means of new means and methods of warfare, especially the application of artificial intelligence, are emerging, which are strategically transformative. Conventional weapons progressively increase their destructive character and in any case continue to occupy the most important position in modern warfare and its hybrid low intensity asymmetrical and interstate conflict. On international relations and within the new multipolar order, a climate of fear, mistrust and opposition prevails 
and multilateral systems are increasingly getting shakier by the day. With respect to defense policies, especially evident in the ongoing arms arms race, the constant use of aggressive rhetoric and the development of increasingly threatening military doctrines emphasize this instability. The danger is also posed by non-state actors and terrorist groups, which are more and more becoming concrete, especially if we consider the potential for damage by new and sophisticated chemical and biological weapons that sometimes fall into their hands. In the light of all of these observations, the occasion of this book launch also becomes a propitious occasion to reiterate the church's and the dicastery's call for a nuclear free world and her commitment to proclaim the gospel of life brought by Christ and to pray and work for the peace of Christ that protects all life. In his annual World Day message in July 2017, Pope Francis called for nonviolence uh, as a style of politics for peace. He also reminded us that violence is not the cure for a broken world. What we need is an ethic of fraternity, and fraternity which subsequently has confirmed this. Peaceful coexistence between individuals and among people. And as he reminded us later during uh, the Nagasaki Day of Remembrance just last year, through November 2019, one of the deepest longings of the human heart is for security. It's for peace and for stability. The possession of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction is not the answer to this desire. Unfortunately, though, our world is marked by a pervasive dichotomy that tries to defend and ensure stability and peace through a false sense of security sustained by a mentality of fear and distrust. One that ends up poisoning relationships between people and obstructing any form of dialogue. But to speak out against the arms race will never be enough. The arms race wastes precious resources that could be better used to benefit the integral development of people and to protect the natural environment. The calculation made by President Eisenhower years ago come to mind, where he said that every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, uh, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone, it is spending the sweat of his laborers, the genius of his scientists, and the hopes of his children. Not too many heads of state have made such analysis, but the analysis of President Eisenhower speaks for several other heads of state who invest in the pile of nuclear arms. We just want to ponder the catastrophic impact of all of this on our human society and renew the call of the Holy Father for a world free of nuclear weapons. And we trust that our conversation this afternoon will advance this type of, uh, this type of uh, move and help us ultimately ensure and secure the prophecy of Isaiah with which we began this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. We'd now like to uh, invite uh, Monsignor Archbishop Richard Paul Gallagher, if you would mind. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all, all around the world uh, this afternoon here in Rome. And uh, it's encouraging to see how many people are participating in this webinar. Your Eminence Cardinal Turks and distinguished speakers, dear friends. I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this interesting webinar and to offer some considerations to the debate focusing on a nuclear weapons free world while in the middle of this current global crisis. The pandemic itself is teaching us a lot. As stated by Pope Francis, 
at the UN General Assembly last September, we are faced with a choice between two possible paths. One path leads to the consolidation of multilateralism as the expression of a renewed sense of global co-responsibility, a solidarity grounded in justice and the attainment of peace and unity within the human family, which is God's plan for the world. The other path emphasizes self-sufficiency, nationalism, protectionism, individualism, and isolation, which would certainly be detrimental to the whole community, causing self-inflicted wounds on everyone. It must not prevail. End of the quotation. Nuclear issues are strongly connected with this twofold perspective. On one side, we are concerned that nuclear powers often seem to continue turning inward, away from multilateralism, as evidenced by the erosion of the nuclear arms architecture, including the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the uncertainty of the renewal of the New START Treaty, expiring in February 2021, and the growing military expenditures for the modernization of nuclear arsenals. On the other side, we must react and be motivated by remaining steadfast in our efforts to work towards nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. The promotion of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is entering into force on the 22nd of January next, and the 10th Review Conference of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, scheduled for August 2021, are two clear opportunities to advance a nuclear weapons-free world. This is like a mosaic whose pieces are the different components of the international nuclear regime, NPT, TPNW, CTBT, START, INF, IAEA, safeguard agreements. This mosaic, however, remains rather fuzzy since some of the instruments of the international nuclear regime have either not entered into force or are not being implemented consistently. By the way, in order to make this mosaic clearer, we need to strengthen efforts to counter the pressures against multilateralism and break the dynamic of mistrust. The Holy See reaffirms its unwavering commitment in this direction, as demonstrated by its ratification of all the main nuclear treaties and its continuous efforts to promote a concrete culture of peace based on the dignity of the human person and on the primacy of law, fostering responsible, honest, and consistent cooperation with all members of the family of nations. This requires careful mediation to foster political dialogue, having particular regard to the importance of focusing attention on the tools to build trust, leverage, and leverage the concept of, cons of memory and dialogue to go beyond the theory of fear and the enemy, to emphasize how nuclear deterrence represents a false sense of security and of stability, and to anchor the question of security to that of development. Taking this last aspect into consideration, another significant lesson learned by the pandemic is the importance to redefine our concept of security. International peace and security cannot be founded on the threat of mutual destruction or total annihilation, on maintaining a balance of power, on regulating relations by substituting the rights of the power to power of right. Peace and security must be built on justice, integral human development, respect for fundamental human rights, the protection of creation, the building of trust among peoples, the promotion of educational and health structures, dialogue and solidarity. In this perspective, it is necessary to go beyond nuclear deterrence and the international community is called to adopt forward-looking strategies to promote this goal of international peace and security and avoid short-sighted approaches to national and international security problems. Achieving a world without nuclear weapons fits in this forward-looking strategy, based on the awareness that everything is connected from a perspective of integral eco ecology. This strategy can only be built through a dialogue that is solidly orientated towards the common good 
and not towards the protection of veiled or particular interests. Furthermore, investing in integral security means avoiding subtracting human economic resources from the complex achievement of objectives such as peace and integral human development. This leads us to explore further the appeal recently reiterated by Pope Francis of establishing a global fund that would foster integral human development with the money otherwise earmarked for weapons and military spending. This appeal resonates also with the MPT preamble, which underlines that the establishment and maintenance of international peace and security are to be promoted with the least diversion for armaments of the world's human and economic resources. In these times of pandemic and global economic crisis, this appeal towards integral human development and towards a new concept of integral security needs to be heard more than ever. COVID-19 proves the urgent need for a globalization of solidarity and for greater investments in integrity, integral security and new models of global cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Archbishop Gallagher. Before we go on, we do have a question we'd like to see if you may briefly respond to. Um, the question is, is there an intention on the part of the Holy See to approach national bishops conferences, inviting them to speak out again ever more clearly on the, moral, on the morally unacceptability of nuclear weapons um, in view of the, um, the entry into force of the treaty in 2021 on the prohibition of nuclear weapons? No, there's no, uh, there's no formal intention at this stage of so doing. Uh, I think that the bishops' conferences are very aware of the position of the Holy See and what the Holy Father has said about this. And we, uh, generally speaking, uh, in a very respectful way, like to leave such initiatives up to the discretion of local bishops' conferences because it's, uh, it's the response is, is different, obviously, in almost every country, depending on policies of governments and positions, uh, geopolitical strategy, etc. So I, I don't think that uh, a decree will go out from Caesar Augustus in this respect, but uh, I think that many of the uh, of the bishops conferences and many, um, they will also be coming under, not say pressure, but being encouraged by uh, many organizations, particularly Catholic NGOs uh, to work in this sense. I think that um, we, it's, it's, a long-term, obviously, uh, objective. It needs uh, to be done with great uh, seriousness, but at the same time, it needs to be done in a, in a spirit of, uh, I think, uh, mutual respect and taking into consideration also the historical precedents for which are you know, differ from, from country to country. But I, I'm sure there'll be many, many initiatives in this sense because, and certainly the, uh, the Holy Father will be uh, in, in the early part of next year, I would suspect will be making reference to uh, the uh, coming into force of, of, of the treaty. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to take the opportunity of introducing Ambassador Rose Gottemuller. She is the Frank E. and Arthur W. Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University's Freedom Spoli Institute for International Studies and its Center for International Security and Cooperation. She is a former NATO Deputy Secretary General and was the Chief U.S. Negotiator of the New START Treaty with the Russian Federation. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the NATO, NATO and the Russian Federation rely on nuclear weapons as a central pillar of their defense strategy. Would you be able to tell us what alternative routes are available to move nuclear weapons out of the center of national and alliance defense policies? And can the NPT's Article 6 prescription for general and complete disarmament help in this regard? Thank you very much, sister. And, and thank you to all for this invitation. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning from California. I will say uh, that I so uh, well have reflected in these years since this November uh, 2017 conference on what an important step uh, the Holy Father and the Holy See were taking in focusing on this set of such important issues. 
I want to stress that from the perspective of the United States and NATO, the emphasis uh, must continue to be on implementing Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, continuing to work toward a world free of nuclear weapons, but also mindful that as long as nuclear weapons exist, we must maintain them, we must ensure that they are safe and secure and don't, do not fall into the wrong hands. In that regard, I wanted to say uh, to this entire audience this morning that I am concerned that the TPNW nuclear ban treaty as written undermines the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. This is a long held view, not only of me, but of NATO itself and of uh, the United States. You might've seen the NATO secretary general's statement on this matter yesterday. Uh, but the concern is because it seems to support different standards from the non-proliferation treaty, particularly in the realm of nuclear safeguards and by placing irreconcilable burdens on countries that are trying to take good care of the nuclear weapons that they possess. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But at the same time, and here I really want to underscore Monsignor Gallagher's words that we need to develop the tools to foster mutual confidence. And uh, we also need to operate in a, an environment of mutual respect. Monsignor, I could not agree more with you. Um, so at the same time, I recognize that the TPNW will enter into force on January 22nd of 2021. So now we must be resolved to look for ways that the two treaties can actually work together to advance the cause of nuclear disarmament. We all embrace the same goal, a world without nuclear weapons. Our differences are how to get there. I believe that the journey cannot be rushed, but we must continue to make steady disarmament progress. And while nuclear weapons continue to exist, we must ensure that they remain safe and secure, lest they fall into the wrong hands and become the tools of nuclear terrorists or madmen. That is why the United States, Russian Federation, in fact, each of the nuclear weapon states under the Non-Proliferation Treaty is so careful about ensuring that they are protecting their nuclear warheads and fissile materials. The nuclear weapon states also care about ensuring that the weapons are effective for if the dreadful day ever arrives when they had to be used, then they must be ready. So we can agree on this last point with regard to effectiveness, but at a minimum, safety and security are paramount necessities where nuclear warheads and fissile materials are concerned. That means that there must be men and women who work to maintain and protect these weapons, not only in the armed forces of the United States, but in each of the nuclear weapon states. The United States also shares certain duties, such as security at nuclear bases with its NATO allies. Shall these men and women be condemned as immoral for protecting us from the misuse of nuclear weapons? I think we can all agree that the answer is of course not. But that is what I mean about putting irreconcilable burdens on countries that are trying to take good care of the nuclear weapons that they possess and will possess for some time, despite, as I said, the fact that we must remain focused on a slow and steady pace toward nuclear disarmament. Thus, I think we need to consider carefully how the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the Nuclear Ban Treaty will fit together to support progress on nuclear disarmament. And I very much look forward to our discussion today in order to understand more about how we take this forward. Progress there must be, even though we often seem to be taking one step forward and two steps back in the nuclear disarmament realm. At the close of my Rome remarks in November, 2017, I said that the Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love, of those Christian virtues, the greatest is perhaps not love, but hope. Today, I'm going to say that perhaps the greatest of them is faith, because faith is the way to possess something that you hope for. We must have faith that nuclear disarmament can be achieved and work tirelessly toward that goal. Again, thank you to the organizers. I'm honored to be with you today, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much um, for your words. And I'll be picking up on, on one thing in, when we move on to another one of the speakers. Thank you so much. Um, now we'd like to move to Beatrice Finn, um, the executive director of the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize winning coalition international campaign, campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, also known as ICANN. 
Um, your mission is the prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons and the mobilization of civil society in this effort. So our question for you this afternoon, what is ICANN doing to increase support for the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons entering into force, as we've said, in January of next year? And more importantly, what role can civil society play in bringing the nuclear weapons states to embrace the treaty? And finally, do you think that the non-proliferation treaty review conference, as um, Monsignor Gallagher said, is up for review next year, will that be an occasion to make progress toward rapprochement? Thank you very much. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, and very, very um, I'm, I'm really glad to be participating here today. Yeah, I mean, the, as many speakers have said already, the entry into force of the TPNW in January is really a, it's, it's really a historic groundbreaking achievement. Uh, it's something that the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, the ICRC President Peter Mara, and of course also Pope Francis uh, recognizes as really an important moment. For the first time, nuclear weapons will be banned under international law. So this is a huge moment, uh, not just for the governments that have already joined this treaty, but really uh, everyone who's been working on this for almost 75 years uh, of anti-nuclear activism. And this moment, I also wanna particularly recognize all of those um, Catholic non-governmental organizations that have tirelessly worked for this issue for so long and particularly um, wanna recognize uh, Sister Ardeth Platt, who passed away earlier this year as one of the strong champions uh, who has been part of this treaty. Uh, and we really, uh, we really miss her a lot. Um, so the TPNW, I mean, it's, it's really, because it's rooted in humanitarian principles uh, and humanitarian law, it demands that we protect civilians in warfare and that we refuse to let civilians be population, uh, civilian populations be targets of weapons. Um, and this is really what nuclear weapons are. Weapons of mass destruction aimed at, you know, massacring civilians. It's an inhumane and in immoral weapon. And now thanks to the governments uh, that have been leading this process, it's also going to be illegal. Um, and I think that nuclear deterrence is becoming increasingly stigmatized as a security policy. And the TPNW represents a much needed alternative for real human security, taking into account people's actual needs. And I think that the current pandemic really showcases that. Uh, we see when the big crisis and the big threat to people's survival comes. You know, what really helped us was uh, healthcare workers, uh, these sort of first responders, uh, people, delivery people, grocery store workers. So. What we're going to be doing now, I mean, our work certainly does not stop on 22nd of January. It's quite the opposite. We are really just getting started on this work. And ICANN will continue to work with governments to increase the number of signatures and ratifications. Uh, each country that joins this treaty will take us closer to a world without nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapon states themselves will not just willingly give up their nuclear weapons uh, one day. We need to help them by creating a new environment really, which is more difficult to have nuclear weapons than it is to get rid of them. And our strategy is really to increase the cost of having nuclear weapons, the pressure, make it more difficult to maintain these weapons of mass destruction. And that's really what the TPNW is about, making sure that nuclear weapons are held to the same standard as chemical or biological weapons or other weapons that are deemed unacceptable because of their unacceptable and inhumane impact on civilians. And I think it's also important to remember that it's not just the nuclear armed states that are the, you know, that have nuclear weapons that are the problem. Also, any state that support nuclear weapons and rely on nuclear weapons uh, as a part of their security policy lends credibility and to this dangerous notion that it is acceptable and legal to threaten to mass murder civilians. And for example, poll after poll shows that people in these countries don't want anything to do with these weapons. And we raise, we're working wherever we can uh, in multiple ways to raise awareness about nuclear weapons, the risks, the catastrophic humanitarian consequences, and what people can do to change that kind of policies. We will work in parliaments uh, with groups of parliamentarians. We will work in the private sector on divestment campaigns, for example. We will work with international organizations like the ICRC, the United Nations, the European Union. 
Um, we will work with communities of faith that play an incredibly important role in this one to get nuclear armed states and the other countries that endorse weapons of mass destruction to take concrete steps towards stigmatizing, prohibiting, and ultimately eliminating nuclear weapons. And you know, one point that I want to raise about the, the connections between the TPNW and the NPT is that the supporters of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons are some of the most committed states parties to the NPT. And they've said this time and time again. Um, but really, the supporters of weapons of mass destruction very often still claim the opposite. They say that the TPNW undermines the NPT, but nothing could really be farther away from the truth. There is no evidence at all that this is the case. And in, in, in all honesty, those kind of accusations really calls into question the seriousness of their own stance towards the MPT. Are they more interested in casting blame and keeping their own weapons than actually fulfill Article 6 and, and other things on the MPT, like the 2010 Action Plan, for example? To me, I, I really think that the real threat to the MPT comes from the states that wants to use the MPT to keep their nuclear weapons, to maintain status quo, and even move backwards today. In fact, all governments uh, adopted by consensus, uh, the MPT action, the, the 2010 action plan, um, which agreed to reduce the reliance of nuclear weapons in security doctrines. And I think we saw, for example, Stato from NATO yesterday, specifically stating that, you know, they're doing the opposite. Um, and, and, and really kind of straightforwardly admitting that NATO states will under no circumstances, uh, you know, de be a part of delegitimizing the possession of nuclear weapons and threatening to use nuclear weapons. And it's really concerning to see such regards and undermining of the MPT because we cannot allow the MPT fa to fail. It's really too important. And I think that we will be working uh, very hard to encourage states parties to to make sure that the MPT review conference makes a real success, not just with the purpose of finding common language, that it's a real progress towards nuclear disarmament and building on to the implementing the commitments made at the NPT, and not just distract everyone by coming up with new variations of commitments that nobody, none of the nuclear armed states are implementing. And here I think that the TPNW, which is a legally binding instrument that commits states to never under any circumstances, even during these very challenging international security times, you know, th that they never develop or use nuclear weapons. I think that's a huge accomplishment over this last review cycle. And I think it's something that should be welcomed by all states parties, no matter if they support the treaty or not. We are seeing, we've been seeing a worsening of the international security situation. And the fact is, Okay. that still the majority of states in the world are, are you know, willing to take further steps is a really welcome thing. Thank you so much. Um, I, I always love to hear the voice of some of those who are actually helping uh, ordinary people discover their voice and finding concrete ways that they can get involved in the question. And this dovetails into our next speaker who will be presenting on behalf of Comese or the Commission of the Bishops Conferences of the European Union. Welcome, uh, Marek Nisak. Um, you're also a member of the Justice and Peace Commission as well, and you're contributing to the work of this Va uh, Vatican Dicastery Task Force on uh, security. So thank you so much as well for being with us. Now we'll move uh, a little bit into Europe uh, regarding nuclear arms. Europe is quite complex. Three states are nuclear powers, others are allied with nuclear powers, and other states are not. And yet the, uh, the erosion of the arms control regime that we heard Cardinal Turkson speak about has left all of the European states feeling vulnerable. So our question for you, um, what do you think are the major fears, but also the hopes of uh, European states that they have with respect to arms control and disarmament. And secondly, can Europe provide alternative paths for the superpowers so as to reduce the threat of nuclear conflict, but also disengagement from military strategies based on the use of nuclear weapons? Thank you, Sister Bernadette, for this kind introduction and really challenging questions. Because indeed, when we look at Europe and the European Union in particular, the picture we can see is quite complex. Following the exit of the United Kingdom, 
France is the only remaining nuclear weapon state in the EU, adhering uh, to the concept of nuclear deterrence, but also expressing certain willingness to a gradual and multilateral disarmament based on the MPT. On the other side of the spectrum, we have countries uh, such as Austria, Ireland, and Malta that are so far the only three EU member states that have signed and ratified the TPNW. And to complete uh, this European mosaic, I may add that uh, 21 out of 27 EU member states are also NATO allies, and four of them are hosting US uh, nuclear weapons on their territory. It is actually in uh, the European Union's DNA uh, to be in constant search for unity in diversity, to balance diverging economic interests, uh, geographical perspectives, and historical experiences uh, in view of the common good. There is actually a common European strategy on non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, uh, which has formed the basis of Europe's global political and diplomatic engagement for nuclear disarmament. The last time uh, this strategy was substantially updated is now, however, more than a decade ago. And in the light of the recent geopolitical, technological, and legal developments, it would certainly need an upgrade. When it comes to your question about the fears and the hopes of Europeans uh, with regard to nuclear weapons, so the crisis of the arms control agreements between the US and the Russian Federation has certainly been a source of concern. European institutions have repeatedly called for maintaining and further strengthening the pertinent arms control architecture, because we see that this might also have significant implications for the European security. On the other hand, many hopes were put in the Iran nuclear agreement as an instrument that could potentially contribute to a greater regional stability and peace. The European Union played a key role in coordinating the negotiation efforts, and now it is seeking to uphold the deal and to provide a new impetus for its effective implementation by all the stakeholders. Many say that nuclear disarmament cannot and should not be separated from broader considerations on security and peace. The European Union is actually currently in the process of defining its uh, strategic compass this is a joint European strategic reflection on the long-term security goals, the threats, and means to address them. Several voices, including European bishops for whom I work, have been advocating that these long-term strategic goals be oriented towards human security and sustainable peace. And this would imply much more than just protection of state or economic interests. In the context of this ongoing European strategic reflection, also the question may be asked, does the possession of nuclear weapons actually serve and contribute to the goal of enhancing the security of persons, families, communities, or does it rather pose a threat? In order to conclude, let me briefly refer to some possible actions that I think would be taken from a European perspective. Internally, the European institutions need to provide spaces for a participatory dialogue in view of redefining the European strategic culture. This process should not only, only involve member states, meaning military and political officials, but also other stakeholders, including academia, businesses, civil society, and also religious communities. This strategic reflection is also a good opportunity to actually upgrade the EU's common position on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Because the question of nuclear weapons is not only of a military nature, but it also has a very strong political dimension, the European Parliament that represents the voice of the European citizens could articulate a bold political vision and ambition in this respect, and also strengthen the necessary political will. At the global level, Europe's strength could lie in promoting multilateralism and a rules-based international order, fostering partnerships with the UN, with NATO, with the United Kingdom, but also with other international actors. In the spirit of Pope Francis' recent encyclical Fratelli Tutti, the European Union could build upon its own experience in strengthening mutual trust and seeking a common ground. And it could use the broad range of the policy instruments it has from diplomacy 
over to trade, development, climate, and human rights to open up new ways of dialogue and cooperation, also with actors that currently show little willingness to advance with nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Europe can and should play an active part in creating the conditions for a more peaceful world. And nuclear disarmament should be an integral part of this process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Once again, you've also underlined the fact that one region of the world is definitely impacted by other regions. So we'll take your cue and we'll move to the, the Middle and Far East. And we'll do that with the help of Kelsey Davenport, who is the Director for Non-Proliferation Policy at the Arms Control Association. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, in your specifically you work in the area of missile programs of Iran and North Korea as well as in international efforts to prevent proliferation and nuclear terrorism. Therefore uh, we look to you today to talk to us about what some of the more worrisome challenges there are today regarding non-proliferation, what can be done to diminish them, and then also your opinion about whether you think that um, non-proliferation is actually a cover for the nuclear states to avoid their obligation to disarm under the NPT. And also, again, looking forward to the review of the NPT, what you think can be done to bring nuclear states toward making effective progress in disarmament to you. Thank you, Sister Benedict, and my thanks to the Dicastery on Integral Human Development for hosting this important event and to all of the sponsors. You know, I, I would note that as a graduate of, of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at Notre Dame, you know, I'm particularly grateful for their involvement in this event, you know, given the, the formative role that the Institute has played in my thinking on these issues. And I also want to congratulate Father Drew Christensen on the publication of his book, Documenting the Vatican Conference, which I have no doubt will be a significant resource in the nuclear policy community moving forward. So as, as several of the previous speakers have noted, you know, there are a number of urgent challenges in the arms control and disarmament space. You know, the nonproliferation arena faces similar significant challenges that require urgent action and I think would benefit greatly from Vatican leadership and support. You know, first, I would note you know, the effective, verifiable multilateral nuclear agreement reached with Iran in 2015, known as the JCPOA, you know, which the Vatican supported, you know, is in jeopardy after the United States withdrew from the accord in 2018 and reimposed crippling sanctions on Iran with an intent to collapse the deal. You know, negotiations with North Korea, which initially seemed promising in 2018, you know, collapsed a year later and failed to yield tangible results that reduced the risk posed by Pyongyang's nuclear weapons program. And now we see North Korea continuing to advance and expand those troubling activities. So looking forward to 2021, you know, I think it is imperative that the United States with the support of the international community, you know, acts quickly to return to compliance with the Iran deal if Tehran agrees to do the same. You know, President-elect Biden has already voiced his support for this approach and then pursue multilateral talks on regional nuclear restrictions, which I think will advance non-proliferation efforts writ large. And I think it's critical that the United States sends a clear signal to North Korea that the United States is willing to engage in negotiations without preconditions uh, through a step-by-step -step process aimed at denuclearizing the North Korea as part of a broader approach to building peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. You know, I see the Vatican and the Catholic community as playing a critical role in supporting these efforts. You know, the church has been, and I hope will continue to be, an important voice in supporting diplomatic efforts to reduce proliferation risks. Just looking at the context of the United States, for instance, the, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops has been critical in maintaining political space for talks with Iran and North Korea uh, by encouraging support for negotiations amongst policymakers, you know, members of Congress, you know, and, and the broader community. You know, I would also note that I think the Vatican's moral voice can encourage states to abandon or modify pressure-centric strategies to address proliferation threats that cause significant humanitarian suffering. You know, as a recent example, I would cite you know, crippling U.S. sanctions on Iran that have hindered the supply of critical medical equipment and medication that have resulted in needless suffering. You know, we, the international community needs to oppose proliferation risks, but within a context that values and supports human life. So making progress on these immediate challenges, you know, I think will help restore 
uh, credibility in diplomacy to address nonproliferation challenges and reduces the likelihood that disagreements over these issues, particularly Iran, you know, prevents consensus at the 2021 NPT review conference. You know, mitigating proliferation threats, I think, also creates more space to focus attention and pressure on pushing the nuclear weapon states to take tangible, concrete actions to realize their Article 6 commitments. You know, but more critically, I think addressing immediate nonproliferation threats, you know, and getting arms control back on track, you know, creates space for more transformative thinking that can help lay the groundwork for eliminating nuclear weapons and eliminating the root causes that pushes states to pursue these weapons because they believe nuclear weapons are integral for their own security. You know, nuclear weapons have played you know, a significant role in, our inter in the international security landscape you know, for the past 70 years. They're embedded in many of our institutions and conceptions of security. And this is why I think many proliferation risks still exist. You know, again, states view these weapons as necessary you know, for their security. So achieving a world free of nuclear weapons you know, requires us to challenge these long held beliefs and normative practices surrounding nuclear weapons. Uh, the TPNW, I think, is an important step in this direction, but, you know, we can and must do more to build on it, both within the context of that treaty, you know, and the NPT, you know, and in other fora. And realizing this vision, I think, you know, there are steps that the Vatican and the Catholic community can take, both at the individual and at the state level, you know, to, to realize this vision of a world free of, of, of nuclear weapons. You know, at the individual level, you know, the church can help build a movement through education and support for concrete tangible steps and outlining advocacy efforts. You know, we must remember that Catholics played a critical role in the movement to halt nuclear testing, you know, and can do so again in advancing you know, disarmament efforts. You know, Monsignor Gallinger noted, I believe, uh, earlier in this conversation that there is no formal plan to encourage the bishops to discuss nuclear weapons. You know, I hope the Vatican, you know, reconsiders this because encouraging priests around the world to discuss the immorality of nuclear weapons, the negative impacts of these weapons you know, in their churches can be an impetus to act. You know, as we look at global challenges you know, and, and, and how local you know, communities you know, are, are much more inclined to encourage, you know, tend to encourage and take action you know, if they see how these issues are tied to their local communities. And the Pope, I think, has very clearly articulated you know, the environmental you know, health and social justice ramifications of nuclear weapons development. You know, so pairing an understanding of how nuclear weapons impact local communities uh, with recommendations for concrete actions, you know, where local communities can be involved, such as urging states, you know, to ratify you know, treaties like the, the TPNW, like the CTBT, you know, challenging, you know, spending on new nuclear weapons, you know, can help empower local communities to act and lay out a path forward to what can seem like an impossible goal to achieve. You know, at the state level, I think the Vatican can also be an important moral and ethical voice for many of the reasons that have already been, you know, laid out. You know, challenging status quo security conceptions. You know, pushing states uh, to um, to take, you know, more specific actions to remediate environmental devastation and address the humanitarian and societal costs of developing and maintaining nuclear weapons. You know, challenging nuclear doctrines that increase the risk of use, and encouraging states to address these root causes of instability and tension. That, uh, that, that push states to maintain their nuclear weapons and push other states you know, to pursue them, believing that they are necessary for their security. So I think it's only with this type of bold kind of transformative thinking that pushes, uh, for, that pushes security conceptions at the state level and seeks to empower a movement at the individual level, you know, will we be able to see you know, more meaningful steps towards disarmament and will, will we be able to actually see the abolishment of nuclear weapons? Thank you so, so thank much. you very much um, for for the time and I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And I really appreciate what you said about uh, we need to have transformative thinking. We need a new set of talking points if we want to move the dialogue forward. And how better to do that with the younger generation? And we're very pleased to have that generation with us advocating on behalf of young people through Ksenia Pernovskaya. Um, you are the, um, you're an education director with the CTBTO Youth Group, which is a group open to all students and young graduates who want to direct their careers to make a contribution specifically in the area of global peace and security. And your group specifically is dedicated to advancing the 1996 Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty's entry into force. So, we definitely need some transformative thinking. 
you've also studied in the Republic of Korea. Can you tell us how, especially Koreans, uh, we've, we've also heard about um, what's going on on the peninsula there. What do they think about the nuclear threat uh, that is present in that area of the world, but more generally the concerns about East Asians? And do you see any way forward in the reduction of tensions on the Korean Peninsula or in the Pacific Basin as a whole? Thank you for your kind introduction and for invitation to speak along such distinguished speakers. Um, so I would like to talk about South Korean's view through the lens of TPNW because we all here to talk about it uh, today. So as you all know, South Korea is quite a peaceful country. It never really initiated a conflict on its own. And South Korea's nuclear weapons research program effectively ended back in the 70s. And it's a, one of the champions of non-proliferation. So why this country didn't really participate in the negotiations of TPNW and condemns along with the US this treaty? So in my talk, I'll try to give the perspective of the South Korean, what, how they see the nuclear threat in general, why they don't support TPNW and what needs to be done for them to feel more comfortable with the treaty. So uh, there are different factors. The first factor is that South Korea is balancing between at least four nuclear powers uh, due to its geographical position, China, US, North Korea, and Russia. So in such a position poses a myriad of security concerns, including nuclear threat concerns. Another factor is that South Korea has been, uh, has been right next to uncontrolled and unpredictable nukes possessor DPRK for a long time. And I think since 2007, the perception of the Southern, Southern people did not really, hasn't really changed a lot. And um, around 80% of people in South Korea still see North Korea as a great threat, especially nuclear threat. However, after two years of some war in 2020, the situation has changed a little bit because DPRK recently announced that it's no longer unilaterally bound to any form of concession made, including the long range missile and nuclear test moratorium, which led to the demonstration of the new strategic weapon uh, during the October parade. So North Korea has again become an aggressor towards South Korea, even considering South Korean motion towards reunification, towards cooperation. Another point is the South Koreans have become actually more accustomed to DPRK as a problematic neighbor. And uh, since 2018, according to survey, the South Koreans see China as their main threat. And the problem with China is that China amounts to a quarter of South Korean exports. So uh, South Korea can't really be too vocal about the rising military footprint in the East Asia of China. However, it's just quietly try to, um, to build on uh, on it military capacity just to be able, if if needed, to retaliate or just to feel uh, safe enough. Um, also, due to the present threat, some polling demonstrates that actually a consistent majority of public in South Korea are for nuclear weapons, either American nuclear missiles deployed or, uh, as we call it, American nuclear extended deterrence uh, to South Korea or they even for their own nuclear weapons. And the problem is that if public is for nuclear weapons, why, how could government be anti-nuclear weapons? So that, that's work needs to be done with people also to make them feel more secure um, and not to want to have such a uh, weapon of mass destruction to be protected. Of course, it's highly unlikely that South Korea is gonna pursue its own military program because Moon Jae-in's current president a stance on denuclearization, non-proliferation are very strong. So it will go to the, uh, it will kind of contradict his points, but still there is a viable option for South Korea to do that if there are, if the concerns are too severe. And this is why this is very incremental for the US to restore the robust alliance with the Republic of Korea. Unfortunately, after Trump's presidency, uh, the relations has got worsened, but there, there are still high hopes due to Biden, um, Biden announcement that he is going to restore all the policies and all the uh, relationship with South Korea as it used to be. So with this, how, how to make South Korea to feel more comfortable with TPNW? The, the, my, my answer would be is to decrease the reliance on nuclear extended deterrence first by solving security concerns. And with this, I have uh, several suggestions. 
So for making security climate more favorable for South Korea to feel secure and um, and not dependent on American nuclear weapons or its or dreams about its own program, the U.S. Uh, has to again become a reliable partner for South Korea uh, for it, for this for this country not to seek for its own nuclear program or not to seek for alliance with China, for example, as a very strong player within the region with whom they have a very strong economic ties. Also, the rivalry between the U.S. and China create dangerous situation within the region because states should work. Uh, because states feel kind of between two fires. So I think this country should work together on East Asian matters, for example, North Korea nuclear crisis. And this is a good platform for countries to cooperate as US and China are the most influential ones in terms of North Korea nuclear crisis. In terms of North Korea uh, nuclear crisis, I think the possible solutions could be the resumption of six party talks just for creating a communication platform for making this matter multilateral rather than just bilateral between US or North Korea or North Korea and China, uh, or if, if for dealing with other issues within the region. And also Russia can, can be included in these talks and um, help out. Um, another suggestion that I have that the cooperation in science and technology also uh, within the region could be helpful on common regional issues such as fine dust, marine pollution or infection diseases or COVID response, for example, because these ties also could assist in building more trust and collaborative spirit within the region. Um, and the last suggestion I want to make is that I am a representative of uh, three youth organizations, uh, CTBTO Youth Group, Young Pogwash, and also the Emerging Net Network uh, from BASIC. And I believe that uh, even if the issues are not resol resolved now, um, it is up to youth to resolve them in the future. So it is very important and significant to build those, those ties and communication channels within the youth for us in the future to communicate better and to build more platforms for uh, resolution of such security issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for your thoughts. Uh, we now have Alexei Arbatov who's joined us. So we'll be able now to, to move toward uh, the, the East, we'll remain in the East. Mr. Arbatov has held various posts within Russian diplomacy and participated as a member of the official delegation for various arms treaties, including START One and START Two. Currently, he is a member of the Advisory Council to the Foreign Minister, and he's also one of the founders and leaders of the Russian-based Luxembourg Forum on the Prevention of Global Catastrophe. So we thank you for being with us today. And we'd ask you uh, to address the issue since the 2017 symposium of which you were a part and you offered a broad agenda for superpower negotiations on nuclear disarmament, there has been a severe deterioration of the arms control regime and there are new challenges to nuclear stability. So what priorities do you see today for discussing, for ne negotiation, for collaboration between the Russian Federation, the United States, and NATO. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here. <clears throat> uh, and uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me. And I remember very well the big meeting uh, a few years ago. It was very impressive. And um, I hope that uh, you continue in your very noble activities. And I think that the uh, role of Vatican and of uh, Christian church in general should become more active and more aggressive in a good sense of this world in promoting the cause of nuclear disarmament. Uh, one of the greatest paradoxes of uh, the present situation is that after 30 years of very deep reductions of world nuclear arsenals, which were reduced by an order of ma magnitude in uh, quantity and uh, by uh, about 30 times in quality, in particular in aggregate destructive power, uh, we are now uh, farther away from nuclear disarmament than we were 30 years ago. It's a great paradox that cannot be 
explained by mathematics or by the law of physics. It's the law of human mentality. But unfortunately, it's true. Presently, when you are talking about nuclear disarmament, this goal seems more, di more distant than it seemed 30 years ago when we started this very radical effort, which was really effective, which uh, made the world safer. Uh, now the world is not safer any longer because even at much lower levels of nuclear arsenals, uh, the intensive modernization of nuclear weapons is going on. They're uh, supplemented by modernization of precision guided conventional systems. Uh, and um, on top of everything, we have now uh, new breakthroughs in uh, space warfare and uh, in, uh, in informational warfare, in, in, in particular in cyber methods and means of aggressive uh, engagement. Uh, there are several principal reasons of this paradox. Uh, there is no time to discuss all of them. I will mention just one, and that's the lack of public awareness of the dire situation, uh, which now uh, is in existence with respect to arms control, nuclear arms race, conventional advanced weapons arms race, and the threat of war, which is once again rising and is presently considerably higher than it was 30 years ago by the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s. The Vatican activity and activity of other Christian churches may be instrumental in bringing uh, public uh, opinion of the world to this reality and making world uh, public opinion and public uh, much more active in applying pressure on politicians to put arms control at much higher place in their priorities than it is now and, uh, and, and much higher than it was during the last 10 years. Since the time when Ambassador Rose Gottemiller and our ambassador um, Anatoly Antonov uh, forged uh, the uh, new start, or as we call it in Moscow, Start 3. Uh, since that time, there was the longest pause in this process than ever during the 50 years uh, of negotiations on strategic nuclear arms, which started 50 years ago in 1969, the longest pause. And this pause uh, cost us dearly. Uh, that is one of the reasons why we have this paradox of today. So uh, hopefully uh, we are now presented with some opportunity to reinvigorate the process once again. The change of the government in the United States the change of position of the government in Russia in favor of arms control gives some hope that we can have a fresh start of this process. What would be my uh, roadmap or agenda for, this, uh, for the immediate future? Of course, uh, all those who are in favor of nuclear disarmament uh, would uh, join the appeal of the uh, Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which calls on all nuclear weapon states members of that treaty, uh, who are at the same time permanent members of the UN Security Council, to strive in good faith for general nuclear disarmament. But this is still a distant goal. Uh, nonetheless, even a very road, a very long road, as Chinese say, a very long road starts from the first step. So now we have a chance to make a second first step after the first step that was made many decades ago when we started this process of physical, practical uh, arms reduction and limitation. Uh, I would uh, say that the first and immediate first step, and that lies on the surface, is extension of the new start. 
not because it's a good treaty, it is a good treaty, uh, but uh, because uh, even more important, its extension would provide us with some additional time to reinvigor the, reinvigorate the process and to uh, intensively negotiate the follow-on to the new start, to provide, to revive continuity, continuity to this process, continuity that was interrupted by 10 years of doing nothing. Second priority would be to uh, capitalize on the new position of the Russian government in favor of the NF Treaty. Uh, this position uh, was expressed recently uh, in, in the form of proposing moratorium on deployment of medium and short range missiles in the European continent Excuse from Atlantic me, to the Mr. Euros. Mr. Arbatov, I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Okay, I'm then sorry. I'll just, I will, without explanation, okay. I'll just list other priorities. Okay. Um, reviving the core of INF Treaty using uh, Russian proposal on moratorium starting the negotiations on start follow on having not so much uh, deep reductions of the ceilings but more comprehensive um, uh, limitation of not only nuclear but precision guided long range conventional arms which are destabilizing uh, revive the joint compre comprehensive uh, action uh, plan regarding iranian nuclear program which is essential to, to support and sustain non-proliferation regime and deal uh, much more favorably, favorably with the uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear, nuclear weapons adopted by the United Nations. Up to now, nuclear weapon states were very negative on this treaty. I propose that they take much more positive step regarding it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as you were speaking, what came to my mind, we do need bridges in this particular debate that is ongoing. And we hope, Jeremy Faust, that you may be such a bridge. You've recently completed a dual degree master's program in nonproliferation studies, both at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations and the Middlebury Institute of International Studies with a thesis on responses of the US and its allies to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Now in the past, Russia and the United States participated in joint threat reduction measures like the Nunn-Lugar initiative. So having studied security affairs, both in the US and in Russia, do you see any openings for similar collaborative measures in the current environment? And do you foresee an increase in such contacts that had taken place between the Russia, between Russia and the United States, both in number and quality. And then lastly, as another young person, what is the role of young people, particularly young professionals in this field? Thank you very much, sister, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the organizers for putting on this event. Um, it was an honor to be invited and participate alongside such distinguished leaders in the field. Um, the Nunn-Lugar Cooperative Threat Reduction Program played an invaluable role in reducing the risk of nuclear proliferation and preventing fissile material from falling into the hands of non-state actors. Accomplishing these tasks during a highly volatile, volatile period of transition in the Soviet Union and its successor states required a high degree of trust. In the current era of heightened tension uh, and hyper-partisanship in the United States, the Nunn-Lugar model may be out of reach. That does not mean, however, that lessons from the program cannot inform efforts at working towards a positive nuclear peace in the current era. The first lesson to take from the Nunn-Lugar program is the importance of maintaining predictability through strategic arms control agreements. Without START I and the INF Treaty, it is highly unlikely that either side would have felt comfortable jointly advancing non-proliferation goals in such an intimate manner. This lesson underlines the immense importance of extending new START now, pref preferably for the maximum uh, term of five years. Without extending New START, the potential for successful bilateral cooperation in other areas would be greatly diminished. Second, the Nunn-Lugar program showed the importance of defining common threats. While Nunn-Lugar was unprecedented in its form, it followed many decades of non-proliferation cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War, even during periods of heightened tension. The non-proliferation treaty itself 
was the fruit of this cooperation. Um, for today, this lesson shows that the US and Russia needs to define common threats. And one way of doing this may be uh, to undertake a joint proliferation threat assessment. Uh, this has been proposed by Sarah Bidgood at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Potential areas of cooperation may involve the Korean Peninsula, the Middle East, or perhaps the proliferation uh, risks posed by advances in nuclear technology. Finally, the non luger program showed that actors on both sides need to be willing to take domestic political risks. When Sam Nunn and Richard Luger proposed funding uh, programs to support uh, securing Soviet nuclear weapons, um, it was a radical proposal after almost 50 years of the Soviet Union being America's principal adversary. On the Soviet and Russian side, um, there was a lot of risks taken by Russian officials in allowing Americans to uh, access to sensitive sites. Um, in terms of growing contacts that can allow for this type of cooperation, uh, setting goals is really important. One rare bright spot for the non-proliferation treaty review conference, uh, process has been the expansion of education in the area of non-proliferation and disarmament studies. Uh, my own master's program is one such result of this. Uh, and I think in the future at various review conferences, whether it be the NPT, the TPNW or others, uh, that education is a goal set out in the diplomatic forum. Second, it's important to foster settings that facilitate frank discussion of sensitive issues. Uh, dialogues led by non-governmental organizations is key in this area, and one I'd like to highlight is those efforts led by Global Priorities that Cardinal Tomasi had highlighted uh, earlier this year in a speech at, Amer at Catholic University. Um, a second governmental initiative that might be an area for these discussions is the Creating the Environment for Nuclear Disarmament that was initially led by the United States. There are some reasonable doubts about whether this is a good faith effort. Um, but as the Biden administration takes office, um, it might offer more insight into how good, how much of a good faith effort this is. And perhaps it's an area that the Holy See uh, may seek to be involved in going forward. Um, finally, uh, young professionals and young people uh, have an important role in building relationships on both sides. Uh, I think in Russia and the United States, it's not an understatement to say that young people have very little political power. Um, so, but one uh, positive, uh, positive reflection of that is that um, there is less inhibition in terms of reaching out to the other side. Um, so forming these personal relationships is key as they've been very important throughout the history of US-Russia uh, non-proliferation cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one more speaker and there's a lot of uh, questions coming in and we are running out of time. So we are adding 30 minutes to the webinar for those of you who may uh, be able to stay with us another 30 minutes, uh, depending on schedules. So just to let you know, our final speaker, uh, Drew Christensen, a Jesuit priest and a distinguished professor of ethics and human development at the Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service and a senior fellow at its Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and a steering committee for Catholic Peace Building Network, and of course, the editor of the book that we're promoting today that uh, Cardinal Turkson showed us at the beginning. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to go back to, uh, in the set of questions, uh, to you, to something that Ambassador Gotta Mueller brought up, one of her observations. Um, first of all, uh, the book. Uh, many of the contributors, many of the contributors to a world free from nuclear weapons, express their hopes for a non-nuclear peace. And so, we'd like for you to share a little bit of the vision that those contributors brought to the book. Also, during the symposium last year, the Pope that gave rise to this book, um, and that was the first time that a sitting pontiff actually condemned the possession of nuclear weapons, which he repeated notably a year ago in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Now, how does this condemnation fit within the Catholic moral theology and social teaching? And then bringing in Ambassador Gottemuller's observation, um, what can we say to people who work in the field, who's, who do have perhaps questions now, even on, on the level of conscience regarding 
the, the condemnation and the way that Catholic moral teaching is moving. Please unmute, unmute your microphone. Thank you. Thank you, apologies. Thank you, uh, Sister Brendanette, for moderating and for your warm welcome. I'd like also to thank Cardinal Turks and the Dicastery for Integral Human Development, and especially Dr. Alessio Pecorario for hosting this web webinar today uh, and uh, marking Georgetown University Press's release of a world free from uh, nuclear weapons. And I'd like to thank two of my fellow panelists for joining this discussion. Building a world free from nuclear weapons is central to Pope Francis' vision of a post-pandemic world built in solidarity. Hope our conversation will be one of many dialogues where men and women of varied backgrounds and citizens of different states will guide our world in a spirit of mutual trust and understanding on the path to security and peace. As former US Secretary of State George P. Schultz wrote on his 100th birthday last week, looking back, I'm struck that there is one lesson I learned early and then learned, relearned over and over again. Trust is the coin of the realm. When trust was in the room, whatever room that was, good things happened. When trust was not in the room, good things did not happen. Everything else is details. 15 years ago, Mr. Schultz and his colleagues were pioneers among statesmen in calling for the elimination of nuclear weapons. They've been joined this year by leaders of Canada and Belgium. Together, they demonstrate that along with religious faith, and humanitarian conviction, the exercise of political responsibility can teach the necessity of the elimination of nuclear weapons. The symposium that produced a world free from nuclear weapons, I'll hold it up again here, um, uh, marked the completion, initial signings and ratifications of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, a project in which Pope Francis and Holy See played a role beside international, international civil society and the majority of nuclear weapons free states. The Treaty's adoption and the symposium with moments of hope for our troubled world. I would like to give our audience a sense of the hopes of that, that marked those days by citing some of the, the witnesses, including some of our panelists today from that meeting to show how, how hope was, was, is generated among those who are working for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Critics often object that abolition of nuclear weapons is a utopian dream. On the contrary, it is a realistic hope. The contributors to the 2017 Vatican Symposium and to the book testify to that hope. I want to share with you a bit of what they say about the hope within them and the hope they give to one another. Responding to those who call abolition a utopian dream, Jody Williams who won her Nobel Peace Prize for work on banning anti-personnel landmines wrote, it is not utopian, in my view, to refuse to accept the world the way it is and working hard to make it different. She continues, anybody can do it. It is not magic. It is finding people who share the same goal, working together to make it happen as it has with blinding laser weapons, landmines, cluster bombs, and nuclear weapons. Those are all weapons Ms. Williams campaigned against that resulted in treaties that banned them. Ordinary people can and do accomplish the extraordinary, she tells us. It's not that people involved are extraordinary. It is the combined talent and force of people working together for the greater good that is extraordinary. Again and again, the Nobel laureates cite the experience of solidarity in action as the proof of their hope that nuclear weapons can be abolished. Beatrice Finn, one of our panelists today, received the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of ICON, uh, writes, a person's of faith, a constant voice pulling us back from the brink of annihilation 
a steady guide out of this prison of fear that we've created. Along with Pope Francis, a Catholic bishop, she chides religious sisters. Some of the most fearless people I have ever known have been women of the church, she writes. I think we all know, she teased her audience, do not cross the sisters. Um, they will not be stopped in their efforts to hasten the end of our nuclear nightmare. My co-editor, Carol Sargent, has collected the stories of many of these valiant women, and she's writing a biography, just to make and rice a longtime plowshare protester. Ambassador Hoy Lomonaco of Mexico, rumored to be a member of the Latin brain trust behind the treaty, likewise testified to a series of diplomatic processes like the humanitarian pledge that started small and in a relatively short period of time attracted dozens of governments to join it. After the 2015 non-proliferation treaty review, as I recall, little more than a dozen countries had made the commitment to fill the legal gap for the prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons. By the time the negotiating conference in 2017 had made the pledge, I urge you to read Ambassador Lamonaco's account of the jigsaw of measures that cumulatively brought about the Treaty on Prohibition. He also, he also recalls the other processes that are leading to a regime that will ultimately eliminate nuclear weapons. Time and again, with a variety of inhumane weapons, he, re, he reminds us, prohibition is in the prelude to elimination. And I have to say that if you look at the history of humanitarian law over the past 50 years, you see an increasing constraint on the possibilities of inhumanity and warfare. Sister, I'm looking at you. Is my time up or can I talk? You have one bit? minute. You have one let minute. Me, let me just uh, talk about uh, about uh, uh, to Telly, uh, Fratelli Tutti. In his recent encyclical, Pope Francis reflects on the failure of states and the inter international system to heed the warning of Pope John the 23rd against nuclear weapons, giving voice to the conviction of his age that it does no longer make sense to maintain that war as a fit instrument with repair, uh, to repair the violations of justice. Pope Francis comments, the opportunities offered by the end of the Cold War were not, however, adequately seized due to a lack of vision for the future and a shared consciousness of our common destiny. Instead, it proved easier to pursue partisan interests without upholding the universal common good. The dread specter of a war thus began to gain new ground. The end of the Cold War was an, a lost opportunity. The new nuclear race is a looming crisis. We threat to gun this crisis. In this context, the ultimate goal, the total elimination of nuclear weapons becomes both a challenge and a moral and humanitarian imperative. In that, in that sentence, Pope Francis gives us his reading of the signs of the times. It is up to each of us in the, in the company of men and women of faith and people of goodwill the commun in communities of moral discourse and circles of discernment to determine together what we, actions we will take to meet the moral challenge and to, and to act in accord and, uh, with that moral imperative. Thank Let's you. Let's the words of the stage of Chicago, former uh, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, don't let a crisis go to waste. And again, let me remind you that the book, uh, A World Free from Nuclear Weapons is available from the Georgetown University Press. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions uh, that we would like to try to fit in. We ask uh, those to whom the questions are addressed to try to be as, as brief as possible. I know that's not always possible, but anyway. Uh, there, we have a question for Cardinal Turkson. Uh, the nuclear conversation is often limited to diplomatic and military communities. How do your organizations promote public education on nuclear disarmament? And do you think that public support for nuclear disarmament could create the needed impetus to move forward renewal of New START and the other treaties? Somebody just observed about uh, you know, public awareness of this issue. And uh, for, the past, for, the, for, for, for the past years, uh, it was a little bit easier to do this, but that's still not continuing. When we did have justice and peace commissions all over the world, 
this this was one of their tasks and uh, it was it was it was it was one of the, the uh, you know objective responsibility you know to share this knowledge and to make this known with a change of name to the Council for Promoting Integral Human Development, just so people tend to get the impression that this is a little bit you know, uh, down, but we try and we, we, we feel we are working that now. Since uh, in the year coming up, uh, the program we formulated for the Council is going to uh, mainstream this and uh, revive the relations with the Justice and Peace Commission through which we wish to pick up this type of public education and public awareness uh, and again. Now we're hoping that through them, we'll also be able to get to the uh, politicians and uh, you know, enable the politicians to also pick up this uh, you know, the, the conversation from the grassroots, from the public, uh, public level to the one step level, which will be the politicians who ultimately then are responsible for the policy formulation of their different countries in this regard. Thank you. We have a question for Father, for Father Christensen. If any use of nuclear weapons is immoral, as Pope Francis has repeatedly said, given the indiscriminate nature of such weapons, and if no Christian can rightfully carry out orders or policies deliberately aimed at killing non-combatants, a quote from the Challenge of Peace and the Catechism of the Catholic Church, does it not follow that Catholics at any level in the chain of command over nuclear weapons must make it clear to their superiors that they would refuse either to give or to obey any such order? Again, please unmute your microphone. Yep. There we go. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think that, that uh, it, it's important for people to discern where they are and what their responsibilities are with, res with respect to the Pope's teaching. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, two commanders of the, the, the US Strategic Air Command have already said in Senate testimony that they would not accept illegal orders. And they defined illegal orders in terms of, of um, uh, the, the traditional just war principles of discrimination and proportionality and said that when those principles would be violated by an act of war, they would, they would refuse to carry it out and offer their commander in chief alternatives for how they should proceed. I think that should be the model for people throughout, throughout the chain of command. Um, I think Pope Francis uh, in his, his moral style uh, wants to lead people to uh, uh, not just a hard decision, but to a notion of discerning how God is leading them to do the greater good. And in that, I think the call is, is to discern with the help of their, their pastors, but also in, uh, in discernment with other Christians and other people of goodwill, uh, what course of action they can take from their position to bring about the changes that will lead to a world without nuclear weapons. Uh, Holy Father has introduced a kind of new dimension to this. The conscience is not just avoiding evil, it's doing good and, and, and taking steps to do good in a new way to which God is calling us. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, also, there's been a shift we've heard from Cardinal Turkson as well that um, integral sustainability, but also the ability of integral development is a definite positive way of, of promoting um, peace. We have a question addressed to Archbishop Gallagher. He is no longer with us, but I'm wondering if Dr. Paolo Convergi, if you would be able to respond to this question. If you could unmute your microphone and let me know if you wouldn't mind responding to a question that was. I prefer not, I mean, I'm not able to do it. Not... Okay, thank you very much. So our next question then will direct to uh, Merrick. Um, a very important initiative by more than 30 leading bishops of the Church of England, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York and the Bishop of Coventry, welcoming the prospect of the TPNW entering into force and calling on the UK government to join the treaty. Um, and the um, World Council of Churches, we're hoping that church leaders and other nuclear armed and nuclear umbrella states 
will make similar calls. And they're asking if you could comment. And while we're on this subject, I'm wondering if you would be able also to respond to a question about Brexit, um, whether uh, Brexit represents an opportunity or an obstacle to promote nuclear disarmament in Europe. Sure, thank you, sister. Bernadette, so maybe the first question uh, regarding, um, let's say, the role of also religious leaders and so these church internal processes in terms of the promotion of uh, the support for the TPNW. So I think there, this message of, let's say, a joint effort has to be, let's say, the leading one. Um, at least from our side, so as, as um, let's say the European wide bishops conference that brings together the bishops conferences from all over Europe or from the entire European Union, our main role is, is here to provide a space for dialogue. So what we also initiated here is uh, an annual meeting of uh, the military bishops and the ordinaries who are coming to Brussels uh, once a year to discuss among themselves uh, so the, the different perspectives uh, that they are having on questions pertinent to security and peace and including also the question of the nuclear disarmament. So this we see as a very important, let's say, first step to provide this space also for church leaders in Europe to come together and to have this exchange of perspectives among themselves. But then, of course, once they go back to their countries, to their bishops conferences, it's, it's very important that they continue, let's say, this uh, dialogue effort and that this doesn't only remain at the level of the bishops conferences among the bishops but as also cardinal turkson was mentioning there are also many important uh, lay movements uh, within the catholic church be it the justice and peace movement be it, the, be it the pax christi movement and many others that also bring together committed and engaged uh, lay people so i think uh, that let's say any such a such an effort towards uh, fostering this uh, awareness and creating also the pressure for the policy world has to be a joint one bringing together the leaders, so the bishops together, also with the lay people. And when it comes to this yeah, challenging question of Brexit, of course, this is a question that Brussels also uh, lives uh, these days. Uh, first of all, I would say that, yeah, I mean, we consider it certainly as a sad story that a member, long-standing member of the European Union is, lead, is leaving um, this community. On the other hand, it has to be said that, especially when it comes to the area of security and defense, the relationship between the rest of the European Union and the UK has been quite a challenging one. So maybe in this respect, when it comes, when the question is about yeah, whether the Brexit could somehow uh, accelerate um, the, the efforts towards nuclear disarmament in Europe, I think there, this could be an opportunity but at the same time, I would like to add that it's very important to maintain a very close relationship uh, and partnership uh, with the UK, because we know that UK, of course, remains part of Europe, it remains part of NATO. So certainly, uh, I mean, for the way forward, uh, a close partnership also on question of, of security and defense is very important. Thank you so much. Uh, we go to Kelsey now. Uh, the question for you, any hope? that with the Biden administration, JCPOA and INF will be back. Yeah, I, I can speak more authoritatively to the, the JCPOA, but um, I, I do think that there are hope you know, for both uh, agreements to, to, to return to force. You know, most notably on the nuclear deal with Iran, you know, Pre Vice Pres or President elect Biden can you know, take steps himself to return the United States to compliance with the accord. He does not need support from the U.S. Congress. Uh, it's simply a matter of passing the executive orders to, to, re, to, to waive sanctions. And he has stated his willingness to do this if Iran does likewise and uh, reverses its breaches uh, to the nuclear accord. And Iranian officials are saying the same thing, that they're willing to move in concert sort of with the United States. Uh, and the breaches that Iran has taken to violate the nuclear deal, you know, while concerning, you know, can be quickly reversed. So I think that a return to full implementation of the deal by both the US and Iran, you know, within you know, three to four months after Biden is, is inaugurated uh, is both desirable and, and feasible. And, and that would be a time frame that would you know, return the, the, the JCPOA to full implementation you know, prior to presidential elections in Iran in June. 
So I certainly think it's it, it, it's feasible and important, uh, but I would urge both parties to also come to an agreement then on further negotiations to address you know, Iran's nuclear program in the long term to build further stability in the region, uh, and also to address the you know, elements of regional security that you know, drove Iran to pursue nuclear weapons in the first place. I mean, this is the best possible way to ensure that Iran doesn't you know, take the decision to go back down the nuclear weapons path in the future by ensuring that its security concerns and that regional stability is met. You know, I, I also think that there may be a possibility to revive the INF treaty. Um, this is a treaty that eliminated an entire you know, class of, of nuclear weapons and delivery systems, uh, an entire class of, of missile systems from both the United States and, and Russia that, that the United States uh, withdrew from formally out of concerns about the Russian cheating. Um, that's slight, a slightly more difficult process because that is a treaty that was ratified by Congress. So determining exactly how the US could return to that deal uh, and uh, it could, could return to that treaty, I think will need to be worked out. But you know, after the United States and Russia, you know, ideally, you know, um, extend you know New Start, the New Start Treaty, and you know, deal with sort of that more immediate risk. Uh, I think you know, looking at the INF Treaty, you know, or some type of, of of similar treaty that again, you know, removes that class of of weapons, you know, would be very beneficial in terms of stability in, in arms control and disarmament. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Ms. Finn. I, I teach young women and men in large part in, the, Amer in uh, the United States who want to make a positive difference in international politics and their eventual careers, especially in social justice issues like climate change, racism, structural inequality, et cetera. But I rarely hear them express any concern for nuclear weapons. Question, do you find young people from countries other than the United States who are focused on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and if so, any organization to which you could direct me? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I think it's, it's, it's a really important one. Um, and, you know, I think I, I travel, well, I used to travel now, obviously not so much, um, but, and, and, and speak to a lot of young people at universities and schools uh, quite often. And what I, I find is that a lot of young people in, in almost all countries, also the United States do care about this issue, but there's just so many issues right now. And there's so many things that feel very urgent that they can physically feel things like in the United States, for example, uh, gun violence, climate change, uh, economic justice, um, all of these other issues, anti-racism, for example, uh, gender equality. And I think that the way we talk about nuclear weapons uh, and the narrative around nuclear weapons have kind of very clearly told young people that this is not for you. We use words, we use terms, we use concepts that are kind of alienating people that might not be technical experts, uh, that might not have, you know, two decades of experience in this field. And I think that's a, that's a real problem because I do find that people actually, young people really do, I think young people are like regular people. I don't think there's a big difference between young people and, and people of another generation. But if you don't have a personal experience of this threat that maybe people that grew up during the Cold War have, I think it's quite invisible. So I think we really need to work on the way we, how we talk about it. Um, and I also think that a lot of people don't see, you know, have failed to see how their actions can make a difference. So a lot of people do support the idea of nuclear disarmament, but have been kind of persuaded that it's impossible. And again, it's the way we talk about this issue. When we talk about these weapons, we focus only on the United States and Russia, for example. And yes, they are the two biggest nuclear armed states, but it sends a strong signal to people in other countries that you don't matter. Like your opinion, it doesn't really matter. We talk about how hopeless and how difficult it is and how we have to change the entire world structure in order to get progress. It's really demoralizing for people. So by talking about you know, what you can do um, on, a, on a local level, for example, through working on cities or regional states, talking about investments in nuclear weapons, which companies that invest and which banks and pension funds currently provide the capital for these weapons to be built. We're talking about, for example, which American universities are involved. A lot of students at, for example, University of California do not know that their university is part of building weapons of mass destruction. Uh, 
So by, by making it a little bit more concrete, uh, I think that you can really attract more people and get people to understand that this issue is not limited to nine world leaders, right? It's not just the people that are head of states of the nuclear arms states that matter. Like there's so many other part, layered parts of this issue. I also think that you have to connect it to these other issues that are very, feels very urgent. Anti-racism, for example, we have nuclear testing. It's you know, very obvious that there's a racist angle on nuclear testing, where the tests have taken place, on which communities and which land, it's former colonies, occupied land, indigenous communities that have suffered the consequences. Uh, gender equality, uh, in terms of how radiation impacts women differently and who gets to be part of the decision making in these things and what do we, what kind of traits do we value in terms of masculinities and femininities. Um, social justice, you know, it doesn't make sense in today's climate to spend $73 billion a year on weapons of mass destruction when that should be going to uh, education, healthcare, you know, nurses, doctors. So I think by connecting it to those other issues, you can see how people can relate to nuclear weapons much more and how they feel empowered to act. And I think that ICANN is doing a great job uh, and many of our partner organizations are doing that around the world. And I know a lot of organizations in the US are also doing a great job. And I think um, Catholic groups are doing a really good job actually to try to, to connect this issue to other issues and, and do that kind of work to make it easier and more motivating for people to relate to the to nuclear weapons and get involved. Thank you so much. And we have time for one last question. And this question is directed to both Kesnia and Ksenia and uh, Jeremy. In the age of COVID, how do we make the case for nuclear disarmament? and conversations about its role in security just as vital as the conversations we're having about global health, the right to labor and food security. Okay. There um, you go. Start, yeah, okay, thank you. Well, I think in the times of COVID, yeah, it is quite difficult for, um, for persuading young people that um, nuclear disarmament or security issues are something that is vital for now. But what I think we can do is that through those initiatives that uh, exist, like CYG Youth Group, MPT Youth, or um, disarm, uh, UN Disarmament uh, Youth Group also, we can educate people through those groups, advocate for nuclear disarmament via social networks, for example, because I think it's a common knowledge that youth is now... Um, well, youth is now mostly present in social networks like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So I believe that if we advocate, if we promote enough the, the fact that security issues and disarmament are vital, even in the times of COVID, and I think especially in the times of COVID, because both health issues and security issues are the parts of the general peace in, on the planet. So people should understand that. And, and when we drew and when we actually managed to uh, for people to pay attention to this issue we have to educate them and i think there there are a lot of educational prop, prop platforms that exist for now for young people and i think we should extend them even more to involve not only people who are studying security issues at the university or who are involved in the movements already but for those who don't know anything about it probably from different spheres because um, I think what we can do now uh, is not about taking political decisions because we don't have strength to do so for now and influence, but what we can do is we can multiply numbers um, and we can multiply in terms of effect, like how many people believe that disarmament is good. Um, and by educating those people in the future, I think they will actually be able to make a difference. Jeremy? Um, I think uh, Beatrice actually put it so eloquently before in her opening remarks um, about how the pandemic shows that nuclear weapons uh, are not effective at meeting 21st century uh, threats to human security like the pandemic so clearly shows. Um, and I think uh, engaging with younger people who might be more active um, in advocacy work, it's important to make clear the linkages between um, that every dollar spent on nuclear weapons is a dollar not spent on addressing systematic inequalities um, or promoting development or fighting climate change. I think 
a link to climate change is um, a good one for engaging youth um, as kind of framing the threat of nuclear weapons and climate change as kind of the dual existential threats facing humanity. Um, and given um, youth support for um, addressing climate change, uh, it may be an area that nuclear advocates for nuclear disarmament can tap into. Thank you. And just one last question to uh, Dr. Alexei Arbatov. Um, it's an issue that's been brought up, for example, in the crisis between the US and Russia. And that is that even with the treaties, there's been virtually no mention of verification of the weapons and the obligation that states have under the treaties. Many of the accusations between states has fundamentally to do with verification. I'd like um, a con your concrete view on this. <clears throat> As I understood the question, it was about the um, uh, difficulty of verification, or, or did, I, did I? Yes, that there's no mention of verification of the weapons and the obligations the states have under the treaties that are already in effect or have been in effect. <clears throat> well, um, let's keep in mind that uh, when the INF Treaty was uh, uh, abrogated, uh, there was no verification uh, in, in action. Uh, and I think that is one of the reasons why there were some very serious mutual accusations of uh, uh, not living up to uh, the treaty verification. Uh, the verification of the INF treaty stopped in the year 2001. If there were, uh, if, it, 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 if it had been still in force, it would be possible to use verification process to make sure that uh, neither Russia nor the United States are in violation of the INF treaty. Uh, but uh, we didn't have any system at the time. The same goes for the ballistic missile defense. Since uh, the United States withdrew in the year 2002, there is no longer any verification uh, which can deal with that. And Russia accused the United States of deploying ballistic missile defense launchers in Romania and Poland, which could be refitted with offensive long range cruise missiles. If we had verification system in place, such suspicions would, 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 would be groundless. So, of course, there are sometimes mutual grievances about the effectiveness of verification system, but as long as, as uh, as the system is in place, it's possible to resolve uh, those difficulties uh, by on-site inspections, by pro providing for additional uh, technical means of verification. Once you have none, you have a fertile ground for a lot of mutual accusations and suspicions. That's, that's the law that we have discovered during the last uh, decades of uh, arms control. Thank you. This then brings uh, uh, to an end this webinar and in the name of the dicastery uh, for the promotion of integral human development, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Also all those who prepared for this webinar, especially Dr. Alessio Pecorario, who's been here, although hidden for most of the time, we, can, we have a lot to thank him, as well as to Dr. Um, Father Christensen and also Carol Sargent for this book, which I'm hoping that you will all be able to uh, purchase and also refer to from time to time. It's very, very informative to say the least, especially from the layperson's perspective. At least I'm a layperson in this area. So anyway, so thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who will be celebrating Christmas soon, I wish you a very, very happy Christmas. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks to everyone. God bless. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. <laughs>